Welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading Matthew chapter 19. Now, this chapter is a very interesting chapter. It's talking about marriage and divorce, what God thinks about it. It talks about little children. It's talking about um, the uh, rich young man and the disciples' reward. So, yeah, lots to, lots to look after, lots to uh, read about here. And so let's get right into it. This is Matthew chapter 19, verse 1. When Jesus had finished these words, this would be the words from the previous chapter. As I said before, the original book of Matthew was not written with chapters and verses. It was just one continuous chapter, one continuous document. And so uh, later on, um, different, different people divided it up into chapters and verses and such. So when Jesus had finished these words, the words that we read about in the last session, he departed from Galilee and came into the borders of Judea beyond the Jordan or Jordan. Great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. Again, a lot of people looking at the healing and the miracles and such, but they don't look at the context. These are people who eat a pretty fairly decent diet according to the, the dietary laws of God. These are people who have been enduring the teachings of Jesus, which is a whole lot more than what people think it is today. Jesus taught about denying yourself, dying. He taught about, you know, you have to give up your life. You have to love him more than anything else. And on and on and on it goes. Teachings, words that are harder than I've ever heard any church leader preach ever in my life. So with that, uh, having said that, these people were ripe for the harvest, so to speak. They were ripe for miracles because they were in a, they were in, um, they were in the context of repentance. They were in the context of, of listening to all this teaching about righteousness against sin, against all kinds of sin. We're going to be talking about it more in this chapter and, you know, against hypocrisy and preaching, you know, uh, for righteousness, what's, you know, preaching for humility and against the pride of man. So these people listened to Yeshua, Jesus teaching and were not offended. It's very important to not get offended. If, you're, if you get offended by the, the teaching or preaching of righteousness or the teaching or preaching against sin or the teaching or preaching of repentance, if you get offended, then you have stumbled at the first step of the Christian walk, okay? So don't get offended at any of this, uh, any of the teachings of holiness and righteousness. And if you don't get offended, and if you repent and listen to him, and you're humble enough to follow him yet, a miracle is right there for you. I've seen people get, I've seen a person, I know a person, I, I worked at a team before where we went uh, preaching to people and there was just one elderly lady and she had something against her mother uh, for, a, I don't know how long, she was an elderly lady, I mean she was in a, she lived in a nursing home, or not in a nursing home, but in a, like an old age kind of a home, um, not technically a nursing home, and um, just the way she spoke about her mother, uh, my team member said to her, you know what? You need to forgive your mother. You really need to forgive your mother. Jesus said, if you don't forgive, you know, you're not going to be forgiven. You got, you got to forgive her. I mean, this is the, this is the basics of the Lord's prayer. Forgive us, God, as we forgive others. And so she decided to forgive her mother and immediately she was healed. She was disabled. She has to, she had to walk with certain aids of walking and stuff like she was a disabled woman immediately she was healed and gained strength in her legs it was an awesome thing she didn't even ask for healing she didn't even ask for a miracle she didn't even ask for a prayer for that all she did was forgive and when she forgave then god released her okay from 
the, I mean, when she forgave the evil that someone else done to her, God released her of the evil that was upon her body, okay? And the same way it goes, and more importantly so, for your soul and for your spirit. Verse 3, Pharisees came to him testing him. And it seems like they tested him a lot, right? Uh, they came to him testing him saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Now, I understand in the context here um, that in these days, uh, because of the uh, the stipulation in the tour that you know a man can just write out a certificate of divorce, just you know take a piece of paper and write on your divorce and hand it to the woman. Even in, in uh, a lot of cultures today, they still practice that. It's just you know it doesn't go through the court system or anything like that. It's just a man. Pay attention. It's a man that that writes the the, the certificate of divorce. It you know in in uh, in uh, in the scriptures. Uh, I do not ever recall ever reading about uh, the woman having the uh, the authority to do that. But it's the man who writes the certificate of divorce and hands it to his wife. So back then there was uh, you know rumor has it that these these men really took advantage of that, you know, well, I'll marry this one and I'll write her a certificate of divorce, uh, you know, the day after, and I'll marry this other one and I'll write her a certificate of divorce after a week. And I'll write another one. I'll, you know, it's like just really making a mockery of marriage, really. I mean, and really just an un very unclean practice, um, defiling, um, and uh, it's very, very, it's an evil practice, uh, casual, casual, um, relationships of that sort. Verse 4, Jesus speaking, he answered, haven't you read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? Now that's in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. The first thing that Yeshua said in regards to marriage and divorce was, hey, look at the way God made it. it this is, you want to know the real, the way that, you know, God's perfect will here, look back to the way he created it, you know, before man had his, any of say in it, before anybody had any way of twisting or corrupting or just adding all this nonsense to marriage and all this, and, and that whole idea of relationships and such. The first thing that Jesus said in regards to marriage, he said, haven't you read that he, speaking obviously of God, who made them from the beginning, made them male and female? Jesus continued and said, and for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Okay. So you need to realize that the idea here is that the, the female is to stay with her mother and father until she's old enough to get married, okay? Um, she is basically, she needs all the help she can get as a female, uh, especially in this culture, in this context, uh, she needs help from her father. She needs help from her mother. Um, and so it says here that the man was, it's the man's responsibility to leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Okay. It doesn't say that the wife leave the father and mother, although in certain circumstances, you know, there's always the exception to the rule that in circum certain circumstances today and throughout the ages, there has been times when it's good for the wife to leave the mother and the father. However, you, you realize here that the females here did not work to support themselves at all. There's no provision for them whatsoever apart from a male in the family. So she needed her father growing up to live. Uh, she, uh, she needed her husband after she got married to live as the primary caregiver. Uh, her father obviously still being there and her mother being there as well, helping out, you know, possibly with the children or anything like that, you know, um, any help that she would need. Um, so that's why it says for the man to leave, for the man 
is to leave and to go and to be joined with the wife. Generally speaking, again, we're talking generals here. Uh, so generally speaking, the wife does not leave the comfort zone or the, the um, uh, her home uh, or her family uh, in a general con uh, you know context. Um, and maybe she moves next door, maybe she's still in the same village. Who knows what the case may be here, but generally speaking, the man is to go and to be joined with his wife. And the two shall become one flesh, okay? So this is when, uh, this is not done, obviously, by some magical words spoken over them or prayers spoken over I mean, them. There's none of, nothing of the sort that's said here about any kind of prayers, any kind of marriage ceremony or service, any kind of documents. It is just the idea of the two being, being joined together and becoming one flesh, um, physically becoming one. So is the act of becoming one there physically. Uh, verse 6, continuing in the words of our Lord, he said, so that they are no more two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let man, don't let man tear apart. Verse 7, they asked him, why then did Moshe, Moses, command us to give her a certificate of divorce and divorce her. So wait a second now. Jesus, you seem to be very strict about this. And we know that you and Moses are, I mean, Moses is right there with you. Uh, you are the prophet that Moses was speaking about. That's like Moses and you are one. Okay. It's not that Moses is over on this side and Jesus is over on this side and they're in their opposites. No, they're one. So, the disciples understood that Moses and Jesus always say the same thing. But here it's like they said, why then did Moshe, why didn't Moses command us to give us a, a certificate of divorce and divorce her? Verse 8, Jesus replied, he said to them, Moshe, because of the hardness of your hearts, allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been so. I tell you that whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries her when she is divorced commits adultery. Okay. Now, there are different things that are spoken in different gospels. Okay. In regards to this. Okay. Now, um, the idea here is that you have a man who divorces his wife. And he's one flesh with her and then becomes one flesh with another. The question is another what? Another virgin or another wife from somebody else? Another, another wife who has been divorced from another husband. Um, he who marries her, the divorced one, commits adultery. So how is that? You say, well, she's divorced, they're separated. How is that that he commits adultery? Because adultery is when the, the, the one flesh is, you got two that become one, and the, and, the, and the one flesh is, what would you say, polluted. Uh, when a woman becomes one with more than one man that's still alive, Okay. Um, so we do have many instances throughout the scriptures when a man became one with different women while they were still alive. And it was, it's not called adultery. Okay. This is in many instances throughout the scriptures, throughout even the law of God. And so the idea is that a man becomes one with a woman and then marries another woman or has a concubine or whatever, you know, the case would be a concubine is like a, you know, a secondary wife, a second class. Um, so th that's the Torah, the law of God, although it says a lot about a lot of details about 
morality and how to live. It doesn't say anything against that. It does say uh, that if if a man has children with, he got, let's say he's got two wives, and in one of those wives is his favorite. Uh, it does say in the Torah, don't, uh, basically God um, instructing the man not to favorite, not to play favorites with the children of the favorite wife over the children of the non-favorite wife, especially if the children of the non-favorite wife is the firstborn. Okay, so... Uh, it does make that clear. And we're going to get to that when we're reading through the Torah, okay? So I'm not going to go into all that right now. But it does, God gives detailed instructions on how a man is to, to manage multiple wives with their children, okay? Um, later on in the, the, the letters of Paul, Paul said that... Um, and we're going to get to we're going to get to this as well. But since we're on the topic, Paul said that a leader of the church should be a man of one wife. Okay, now that doesn't mean that you know. Let's say, for example, Johnny here, he's seventy years old. His first wife passed away when he was thirty. He got married again, and then his second wife passed away when he was fifty. Then he got married again. His third wife is is still alive. That doesn't mean he has three wives. He never had three wives simultaneously. You need to understand Paul's idea and Paul's view of marriage is this. You know, he said, if you can restrain from getting married, it's good because you have more time. You know, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You have more time to dedicate to the Lord. So Paul's view of marriage is marriage keeps you busy with the things of this world. Okay? So if you're married to one woman, you're you're busy with that woman. You're busy with the you're, you're not that you're completely sold out to that, you know, the the whole thing of being busy with with one woman. But Paul's idea of marriage is it takes a lot of time away from you. Now, when he said that, a, that a, a leader of the church should be a husband of one wife, in context, again, looking at the full context of Paul's letters, he was saying that a man would not have enough time to manage, you know, four wives and a church. You know, so if you're going to get married and leader of the church should only have one wife, because that way you're not going to be spread too thin. OK, and so, again, take it. Don't be so narrow minded that, you you know, you can look through a keyhole with both eyes, you know. And so look at the entire scope of how Paul spoke about marriage and what his ideas of marriage was okay and that reminds me as well in first corinthians chapter 7 paul made it very clear that what he said in that at least in that specific instance was his own word his own instruction not god's word he said what i'm telling you is my my basically more or less my opinion not from not god's i don't have any command of god this is, my, this is me talking to you okay now that flies in the face of a lot of uh, modern day, you know, you know, ultra conservative evangelicals that say every single word of the Bible is the word of God. Well, you, <laughs> you look right there; it says it's not. It says it's not. It's specifically in First Corinthians chapter seven. We'll get to that. So, um, here again, when you have Marriage and divorce is a very, very co complicated thing, and you know there's there's a wide range of uh, of different um, different applications uh, to the Word of God and uh, and such, and so it is a very you know like Jesus said, best the best is you don't get married at all if you can if you can just to devote yourself completely unto God, but if you do get married, that's fine. You know, um, not that it's 
wrong. So there's the best, you know, there's the better, uh, you know. Then there's uh, things that are not so good, and what, like what uh, he's talking about here, um, committing adultery. So he says, he who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. How is it? Because no matter how, a paper that says that she's divorced does not change her molecular structure, does not change her physical, you know, scientific state. She's still one flesh, okay? It says one flesh. It doesn't say one mind. It doesn't say one spirit. It doesn't say one word. It doesn't say one, you know, in law. It says one flesh. They literally become one flesh. So just because she's broken off, I mean, I can take, here's a, here's a pencil, okay? I can break this pencil in two. Each half is still going to be made of the same, it's still going to be basically one, right? I mean, the two halves of one whole, okay? Uh, so you can write a note and say, this half of the pencil divorces the other half. Well, it still doesn't make it, you know, completely different, a uh, different pencil. It doesn't, You're st it's still the same pencil. And so it's still two halves of one whole. Okay, so a, a divorced woman is still one half of one whole. Um, and so a lot of people would say, well, don't you think, you know, you know, that she'd be forgiven and she'd be allowed to marry again and that wouldn't be adultery? Listen, God, forgiveness is a thing, is a spiritual thing. It's a thing of the heart. It's not a thing of the flesh. Okay, when God forgives you, you don't. You don't trans, you know, transform or transfigure into some other completely, totally different person. You know, when you're born again, when you get born, when you get born again, or when you get forgiven of God and you get born again, yes, you're a new creation, but you still got the same father and mother because you still have the same flesh. Okay, and if you were married before you were born again and you're divorced. You're still one flesh with that person. And it doesn't matter whether you're born again. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether you're forgiven. You are still one flesh. And if you know that woman decides to marry again, she commits adultery. It's very clear here. And I mean, this is a very complicated situation. I'm just going through the whole I'm going through it as fast as I can without getting too much, you know, into it. Um so there's a lot to say here. Um, you know, hey, feel free to comment, okay? Um, it, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of comments because uh, it is a very touchy subject with a lot of people. But hey, let's go with the word of Jesus, okay? Let's go with the word of Jesus. You can say to somebody, well, you know, this person here is a hypocrite. And he says, and he tell, you know, he tells me not to marry divor a divorced woman. He's a hypocrite. Well, you know what? If he, if he says the same thing as what Jesus said, it doesn't matter whether that person is an angel or a devil. If he says the same words that Jesus said, you better do it. Like Jesus said about the Pharisees. Do what they do. No, excuse me. Do what they say, but don't do what they do. They say all the right things. They give you all the right commands. They tell you to observe all the right observances. I want you to listen to the Pharisees. Is what he, Jesus told. I, um, we're going to get to that very soon here in, in Matthew chapter 23. Jesus told his disciples, listen to the Pharisees. He told them to listen to the Pharisees. And a lot of people, especially in some of the Christian circles today, they, they're so hateful of the Pharisees. It's like, oh, you're a Pharisee. You know, just completely ignore, completely not want to hear anything about, you know, from this person because this person's just a Pharisee. Uh, that's not the way it goes. Jesus said, listen to the Pharisees. Listen to them. Do what they say to do. Do what they say to do. Observe the same observances that the Pharisees say to observe. Just don't do what they do because they don't practice what they preach. You should practice what they preach is what Jesus was, was saying. Okay, so yes, um, 
verse 10. His disciples said to him, If this is the case of the man with, uh, with his wife, it is expedient not to marry. So you, you see now, even the disciples were like throwing in the towel, just saying, Hey, what you're saying is so strict. And what you're saying is almost impossible to obey. So much so that if that's what you're saying is true, Lord, then it's better not to marry at all. This is what this is what Jesus said to that. In verse 11, he said to them, Not all men can receive this saying, okay? But those to whom it is given. So there are, let me just come in here. There are some men who can obey this particular guideline that Jesus is about to lay out here. There are some men that can wear this shoe, is what Jesus said. Not all men can receive this. Okay, He realized not everybody can do it. So he didn't command everybody to do this. But only to those whom it is given. If you, if you got the strength and power to do this, do it. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. Okay, They were born with a deformity where they could not ha- get married. They could not have children. And then there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. They opted in. They, it's like they went to the doctor and said, make me a eunuch. I want to be completely celibate. I want to not to have any kind of uh, ambitions to get married at all. I just want to completely be, you know, uh, not, <laughs> not able to have children or get married or not have any of these uh, passions and such uh, in, in that way, at least. Um, and then there are eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs. Okay, so those are people who they don't have a deformity. They haven't been to the doctor to had any kind of surgical, um, you know, uh, operation to make them eunuchs. But they decided to put their passion and their desire you know, to death, basically. They decided that uh, marriage, I'm not going to get married. I'm going to dedicate myself completely, wholly to the Lord, you know, like, you know, some of the uh, the monks do today and such. But uh, that's another whole topic there. But there are those who make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Okay. He who is able to receive it, let him receive it. So again, there are commandments who are that are greater commandments, obviously, there are commandments that are lesser commandments, like this, where it's like this is a commandment that is not for everybody, only for those who is able to do it. Jesus is like saying, hey, if you're able to do it, do it. If you're not able, okay. Verse 13, the, then little children were brought to him that he should lay his hands on them and pray. And very interesting that it talks about little children just after he talks about marriage and family and such like this. So the little children were brought to him that he should lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Allow the little children and don't forbid them to come to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to one like these. He laid his hands on them and departed from there. So Jesus truly does love the little children, as the song says. Verse 16, Behold, one came to him and said, Good teacher. Okay, so this would be uh, good rabbi in, in the original language. Okay, good rabbi. What good thing shall, shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Okay, now right here. Jesus had all of the opportunity to, to, to preach the modern day Roman road of salvation. Okay? Jesus had all the opportunity to say, Hey, I am the life. I am the door. Just believe in me. That's all you have to do. I mean, he said it in other circumstances. Okay? But take it all in context. Jesus could have said, get down on your knees, say the sinner's prayer to me. He had all the opportunity to say whatever he wanted to say here. 
the question is, again, the question is, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? A lot of people would ask Jesus that same question, even today. Good, good teacher, rabbi, what good thing should I do that I may inherit eternal life? How can I get saved? Jesus had all of the opportunity to say whatever he wanted to say. He had, the, he had his perfect opportunity to say, I, you know, just go away and say that, you know, I was wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your iniquities. Just believe in me and, I'll, and you will be saved. Call upon my name. And that's all you have to do is just call upon my name. Oh, you just, 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 you know, look at me, just believe in me because I am the life, I am the way. He could have said anything. Again, he did say those things in another circumstance. But it, once again, take it all in context. The word of God is forever settled in heaven. There's no, you know, this word is for this time, this word is for this time, this nonsense. The word of God are you know the words of God are the ways of God, which is a direct reflection of who God is, which never changes. Okay. Jesus said, Why do you call me good? Okay. Now it says the MT and TR. Um the NU, which is the oldest the, what a lot of people believe to be the oldest manuscripts, the oldest documents, says, why do you ask me about what is good? Okay. So why do you ask me about what is good? Or why do you call me good? Why do you ask me about what is good? Why do you call me good? You said good teacher. You know, in, uh, in Hebrew, it means mean like Rabbi Tov, good teacher. No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter eternal life, if you want to be saved, what did Jesus say? Just say this in his prayer. Just come forward to the altar. Just accept me because I am the way, the truth, and life. Because I am the life. I am the door. What did Jesus say here? Uh, what does your Bible say? If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. <gasps> what? Jesus said that? Yep. Yep, he did. That is the words in red. This is the same Jesus. This is the same age that he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the same so-called age that Jesus said, I am the door. I am the gate. Okay? In context, what he says here is keep the commandments. You can't go through the door. You can't go through the gate. You can't go down the way and still keep sinning. John made that very clear in his letters. Sin as 1 John 3, 4, is the transgression of God's law. What's God's law? It's in every Bible. And the Bible, there's so many Bibles. It's the best-selling book of all time, a lot of people say. Bibles all over the world. The law of God. You want to know what the law of God is? Start reading. Start reading the Bible. The whole Bible. And then some, okay? And then some. No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He could have said, if you want to get saved, gee, it's, all, it's by faith you're saved. It's not by works. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to work. You, you know, see, people don't understand that when Paul said it's not by works, he was actually quoting it from the Torah. Huh? 
Yes, he was. You know, after the Torah came down through Moshe, after the Torah got written down, but with, uh, came through Moses, as it was, as Moses was wrapping it up and God was wrapping it up, Deuteronomy chapter thirty, near the end of the Torah, he said, "It's this is not hard. You don't have to work so. You don't have to climb up to the to the highest heavens to get it." You don't have to get on a rocket and try to somehow find that. You don't have to build a huge ladder, you know, 300 gazillion miles high. You don't have to dig down into the core of the earth to get it. You don't have to. It's not by works. It's right there. The word of God is right there. The commandments, the Torah, the instructions, the guidelines, the ways of God, the person of God in written form so that you can read it and you can obey. It's right there. And a lot of people say, oh yeah, it's not by any kind of work of man. It's only by God's grace. It's only by faith. (laughs) These are the same people that believe in preaching the gospel so that people get saved. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Whose work are you trusting in? The preacher's work. Somebody's got to work. Then you got to go to the meeting. You got to go to the TV. You got to turn it on. You got to listen to it. You got to go to the radio. You got to turn it on. You got to listen to it. You got to go to the computer. You got to go to the media, any kind of media device whatsoever, cell phone, whatever it is. It always involves work. It's, it is absolutely, what's the word for it? it it's absolutely wrong. That, you, that, that someone can just get saved without any kind of work from anybody. It's wrong. It's just wrong. You need a preacher. You need a receiver. You need to, you need to go and listen somehow. You need to do something. Tap the screen, turn the button on, go to the meeting, whatever the case may be. And that preacher's got to work hard too to preach that message. And if he's preaching the right message, you have got to obey the word of God. Keep the commandments. You can't just go to Hitler and say, okay, keep on killing the millions, keep on killing. You've accepted Jesus as your Lord and said, you're going to heaven. Nonsense is, is not even touching what needs to be said about that kind of doctrine. It's evil. It's wrong. So then the, uh, so then the man said to him, which one? So which commandments? Okay. So he's kind of, he's kind of pressing. He's trying once to get more details here. Yeah, of course, you know, Jesus is talking about the commandments of God. Uh, So Jesus said, you should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not offer false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he, Jesus quoted the Ten Commandments, or at least a good part of them. And then he also quoted from the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Okay. So Jesus made it very clear. Do these and you'll be saved. This is the same Jesus at the same time, the, the same one. Could have been the same month, for all we know, that he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Take it in context, my friend. Take it in context. Yes, no one can come and know God as Father. I mean, a lot of people can come to God. They do a lot. And it even says that Satan comes to God, accusing the brethren. Uh, over and over and over again. So yeah, if someone can come to God without Jesus, sure they can. Does that mean they're going to be forgiven? I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father. Father. So you don't know God as Father apart from Him. Again, we'll get to that. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a future session. Verse 20. 
The young man said to him, All these things I have observed from my youth. Do What do I still lack? So he, he knew within himself there's still something missing. Jesus, you didn't tell it all to me yet. Again, when you read John 14, verse 6, when you read John 3, 16, you got to say the same thing. What do I still lack? Because you can't just take one little snippet, one little nugget and and think you got it all you can't oh i believe in jesus i'm saved uh that's a beginning Uh, you gotta read the scriptures and you have to obey god don't think he's gonna let you in if you're a rebel against him rebels against him don't go to heaven oh but when i die i'll be different (laughs) you're putting more faith in your death than in No, you can't wait until you die. You're supposed to die to yourself now. And then uh, repent and and turn to God. And, and, uh, you know, obey as much as you can. That's all that God wants you to do. Not every commandment is for everybody. Obey as much as you can. We just went through that, how Jesus gave a commandment. He said, this is not for everybody. Okay. So the young man uh, understood that he still lacked something. Verse 21, Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, ha ha, okay, so now we've got something, so uh, we've got something else coming out, okay? See, this is what people need to do. Like I said, don't just quote John 3.16 or, you know, read Psalm 91 or or John 14 verse 6 or say, oh yeah, uh, Romans 10 verse 9, you know, all I got to do is just come to Jesus and confess him as Lord and I'll be saved. Uh, That's a beginning. That's a very, very generalized summary. It's like saying, you want to get to Hawaii? Go that way. Uh, there's a lot more to it than just that, okay? You know, thanks for the instructions, but there's a lot more to it than, than just that. There's a lot more to it than just belie- just coming to the Lord and confessing Him as Lord. And, 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 and you know, because Jesus said him very, him, Himself, there'll be a lot of people that come to Him confessing Him as Lord, and He will, he will reject them because of their sin. We read that in uh, Matthew chapter 7. Check it out. If you haven't seen the video from Matthew chapter 7, check it out. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor. So take everything you got. Okay, Take it all. Sell everything. Give it all to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. And then come follow me doesn't just mean tagging along like a little puppy dog behind Jesus. That's not what it means. Jesus, when when you follow a rabbi, when you follow a teacher, you're, you're doing what that teacher teaches you to do. You're taking his example. You are putting it into practice. You are taking his word and his actions, and you are taking that and you are applying it to yourself. You are practicing that. Verse 22, but when the young man heard this, he went away sad for his, for he was one of, uh, who had great possessions. We don't know if that man ever did sell everything. Maybe he did. Maybe he, maybe through the resurrection of Jesus, maybe through the things that happen, you know, that would happen in the future, that, you know, that he would be one of those ones that looked on and said, my, you know, Oh, truly you are the Son of God. How can I but not follow you? Verse 23. Jesus said to his disciples, Most certainly I tell you, a rich man will enter into the kingdom of heaven with difficulty. Here's the easygoing hippie Jesus. Let me tell you something. There's no such thing as an easygoing hippie Jesus. Verse 24. The words in red, the words of the Lord said, Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into God's kingdom. Does that mean it's impossible for a rich man to get into God's kingdom? No. Uh, now, th- this again is is something that's been 
more or less a rumor that's been spread around. But I've, you know, I've heard that the needle's eye is actually a, a gate in the wall of the temple. That is a very, very small gate. Uh, if you if you're riding a camel, you'd have to get off the camel. You have to let the camel go through. Then you I mean you have to take all the baggage off the camel before you can go through. It's just a very very narrow thing, very narrow gate. You can't take baggage with you. You can't. You got to squeeze through there basically with nothing but yourself. You know, in your birthday suit more or less. But um, yeah, so. You gotta. You have got to leave everything behind when you follow Jesus. You've got to leave the friends behind. You've got to leave the unbelieving family behind. You've got to leave your reputation behind. You've got to sell out. You've got to sell out. And this is the words of Jesus. A lot of people don't want to hear it, or they can't hear it, or they just whew, goes over their head. This is what Jesus said. What can I say? It's, this is the words in red. Verse um, 25. When the disciples heard it, they were exceedingly astonished, ah, like marveled, saying, who then can be saved? So Jesus made it so difficult to be saved. Even his own disciples were like, oh my, this is astonishing how difficult this is. Hey, this is what the Bible says. If you call yourself a Christian, if you go to church, you better believe this. This is where it's all at, buddy. This is where it's all at, my friend. Verse 26. Looking at them, Jesus said, with men, this is impossible. You can't get saved. But with God, all things are possible. God can help you to obey the commandments to leave everything behind, to totally and absolutely, unequivocally, undeniably, positively repent. Burn your bridges. Sometimes that can be literally burning your old stuff. Verse 27, I mean, they didn't in the book of Acts. We'll get to that as well. Uh, verse 27, then Peter answered, behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? We have left everything. What will we have? Okay. We left everything. We left our fathers. We left our mothers. We left everything to follow you, Jesus. You're, you are the one. We left our bank accounts. We left every dime. We left our all the money we have, we left everything. Jesus said to them, most certainly I tell you that you will, that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on the throne of his glory, you, will also, you also will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Ay, ay, hi, am I. Woo! That's pretty hot. That's pretty hot. The regeneration, for those of you who don't know, has not happened yet. That's when the old earth has passed away and the new earth has come. That's when death is gone. That's when sorrow is gone. That's when the Son of Man will sit on His throne of glory, rule and reign from the new Jerusalem. Reign. How will He reign and how will He rule? A king can't reign or rule without laws. You can't rule without rules. What will He use for His rules? It's obvious. It says right in, in the Scripture. Isaiah chapter 2, Micah chapter 4, he uses the Torah. What else would a Orthodox Jewish rabbi use? Verse 29, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake, will receive 100 times and will inherit eternal life. But many will be last who are first and the first and first who are last. You have to not try to always be the high and mighty one, the proud one. You got to humble yourself. 
Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, the scriptures say, and he will lift you up in due time. If you lift yourself up, he'll knock you down and it's going to be a fall. When, you, when God knocks you down, yeah, you're down. <laughs> you're down. No, no question about it. No choice. End of story. You're down. But when you lower yourself, how do you get to God? He says, I live in the highest place and also, also with him who is lowly and contrite in spirit. I live in the highest and I live in the lowest. So you can't get to the highest, but you can take yourself to the lowest. So you can meet God there. How do you do that? Get rid of all every every smidgen of your pride. Humble yourself. Obey his commandments. Repent. Believe. May God enlighten you, give you understanding more than you can ever imagine through the reading of his word and through the discussion of his word. May God open your eyes, open your ears, open your understanding, open your mind to understand the wonderful things that we can find in the scripture. Thanks for watching.